People receive hundreds of digital messages a day, from push notifications to emails. So how do you engage your top prospects and stand out? By sending personalized gifts the old-fashioned way with Sendoso. Sendoso helps you use gift-giving and direct mail throughout your customer lifecycle, from lead generation to converting customers into brand advocates. From sourcing to sending and centralizing the direct mail and gifting process, Sendoso helps you scale your gift-giving, stand out, and keep your brand top of mind. Visit Sendoso.com to learn more. You're listening to B2B Growth, a daily podcast for B2B leaders. We've interviewed names you've probably heard before, like Gary Vaynerchuk and Simon Sinek, but you've probably never heard from the majority of our guests. That's because the bulk of our interviews aren't with professional speakers and authors. Most of our guests are in the trenches leading sales and marketing teams. They're implementing strategy. They're experimenting with tactics. They're building the fastest growing B2B companies in the world. My name is James Carberry. I'm the founder of Sweetfish Media, a podcast agency for B2B brands, and I'm also one of the co-hosts of this show. When we're not interviewing sales and marketing leaders, you'll hear stories from behind the scenes of our own business. We'll share the ups and downs of our journey as we attempt to take over the world. Just kidding. Well, maybe. Let's get into the show. Welcome back to the ABM series on the B2B Growth Show. I'm your co-host, Dan Fronin, CMO at Sendoso. Today, I'm with Justin Keller, and he's the VP of Marketing at Sigster. Justin, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Dan. I'm glad to be here with you. Awesome. Yeah, I love starting my days this way, talking to super smart people. Uh, So I think before we get started, I'd love for you to tell us a little bit about Sigster and something that I heard yesterday around uh, your new partnership with Terminus. What's that all about? Yeah, yeah. So um, Sixter has been around for, uh, let's call it four years, maybe not quite four years, and start with a super simple idea around kind of making everyone's signature look the same, right? Super simple premise. And I love like basic ideas that turn into something much bigger. Um, once we kind of built that out, we realized, you know, holy crap, we're sitting on a massive distribution channel that no one's taking advantage of, right? So we, we built the capability to insert targeted, dynamic call to action banners in the signature section. So we're basically turning employee email into a high volume ad channel. And then about a year and a half ago, we, we realized, oh my God, there's even more here than we thought. There's such like a wealth of analytics that are you know, untapped and unused by marketing that are so important, especially as marketing and sales get tighter. And that's around the relationships that are developed over email. Like email is the lifeblood of business. That's where the majority of communi- communication happens. And if we can kind of better understand and mine that data, then we can quantify relationships that are going to be really useful to revenue teams. And so between those two things, the ad channel and you know, the engagement analytics, uh, Terminus made the strategic decision to acquire us. So we are now a Terminus brand as of yesterday, um, which is super exciting. And uh, we've got a really big vision for the future on how these, these companies are going to come together. Bravo. That, I can't wait to see that unfold. I think th- the way that you describe it and the fact that email is probably, by and large, the, the largest single impression channel on the planet on the B2B side, it's going to be amazing to see what you guys do together. We're really excited. Um, so today we're going to talk to you a little bit about how you took your marketing strategy at Sixter and, and really became account focused. But before we dive into that topic, uh, I'm always fascinated with people's backstories. Um, I think it's valuable for our listeners to hear how you got to your VP of marketing role at Sixter. Uh, tell us how your journey unfolded and maybe how, how uh, the audience can, can get to where you are. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I think... Um you know, pretty humble beginnings, right? Just kind of from a small town in Indiana. I was a barista at a Starbucks through college. And then my, my first job out of college, I got a really unique opportunity. Um, it sounded good on paper, which was to go work for a uh, serial entrepreneur uh, in Indianapolis. This was the guy that invented voicemail um, that we all use and you are used to use, I guess, probably. I don't think people use voicemail like they did. Go work for him. And I'm like, you know, that sounds like a great person to learn from. And that kind of like great person to learn from can see is kind of has driven a lot of my decisions in my career. But uh, the job wasn't as great at the start. I was basically working in a air conditioned warehouse organizing about 30 years of his life into shelves. So it was grueling. It was awful. But the payoff was there because, you know, being around him all the time, he was about to start a new company and asked if I'd like to help him build it. So I was the first employee at a company called Cha Cha. 
which was back in the day before uh, iPhones were ubiquitous and people were just kind of had the, the flip phones. It was a service you could chat or you could text with a question. So it was basically a text-based search engine. And uh, it, it took off like a rocket. Um, we went from kind of being a startup to being the 50th most visited website on the internet in about two years. Really huge growth curve. But then uh, the iPhone came out and I saw the writing on the wall and didn't know exactly what the future of the company looked like. But I did know that I wanted to do high growth tech, really kind of bleeding edge stuff full bore. So I went and I um, got my MBA. And the day after I graduated, I packed up my car and I just drove to San Francisco. I couch surfed. I tried to meet people. I, I sent cold emails to CEOs. And finally, one wrote back and it's like, hey, you know, come, come stop by and let's chat. And so uh, I was lucky to find a guy that was willing to take a, a chance on some unknown kid from the Midwest and kind of started running a marketing program. And I had not done that before. But it's one of those things where I acted like I'd always been doing this, right? And I just kind of, you know, the old fake it till you make it phrase is exactly what I did. Had a good run there, um, ran a few more marketing teams in the Bay Area, kind of just sharpening my marketing knives the whole time I was out there. And then my wife one night looked at me and said, you know, I'd like to get back to Midwest at some point. We've got, you know, parents that are getting older. We've got cute nieces and nephews that are getting older. And she wanted to be part of that. And so I said, sure, you know, 18, 24 months from now, let's, let's definitely, you know, pack up the wagons and head back east. And as soon as the universe heard, that, heard me say that, two weeks later, um, I was on a flight to Indianapolis to interview with Sigster. And I've been here for about two and a half years now. And it has been probably the most rewarding part of my career so far. I just love working with the team here and I love all the things we're doing. Now, that's, a, that's an amazing journey. I think there's so many similarities to what, what you've done and what I've done. I started by changing oil when I was in high school. I faxed out my resume. Yes, fax used to be a thing um, <laughs> <laughs> to anyone that would take it. I went to grad school. I faked it until I made it. And then you know the universe aligned when I had my first kid to land me here in the Silicon Valley. So I love hearing stories like that because I think if you're, if you're working hard and keeping your eye on the prize and doing the right thing, then, then it always works out. So really awesome for you to share that story with us. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you're you know that. Like I think it's one of those things you just gotta like act like it's gonna happen and, yep. it, and it will. Yep. Positivity, right? <laughs> so I, I think to frame this conversation, your team put out an amazing piece of content that that we love here at Sendoso. And it's it's framed around uh, from no ABM program to award winning ABM program in one year, which to me is like about as close as you will ever get to a silver bullet in B2B marketing. Yes, silver bullets <laughs> kind of exist, but it takes a year, <laughs> not a day. Um, so, I mean, from, from looking at that piece of content, I'd, I'd love to start with you know, asking you, what are the things that made your team rally around the idea of launching an ABM program in the first place? Yeah, you know, it was, it was two big things. And the first one was kind of obvious. Like we ourselves had just, and this is right when I came on board, had just launched kind of uh, an account-based feature, right? Where we're starting to insert targeted ads based on the account that someone is at. And so it was one of those things where it's like, well, we sell ABM, we need to also be ourselves ABM. So we, we kind of had to walk the walk. But the other part was, you know, we are a venture back company, but, you know, I, not, not a huge, you know, bought a cash supporting us. I had a very modest budget, especially compared to the revenue goals we had to hit. And, you know, having the built, I don't know how many, five kind of inbound programs from scratch over my career, knew that, you know, from everything I'd seen, there was no way we were going to build a mousetrap that was going to get us to hit that revenue target that we needed. Mm -hmm. And so it had to be marketing going out and doing hunting right alongside our sales team. And um, so that was kind of it. It was like, you know, there's no other option, guys. We're, we're going to miss our numbers if we don't kind of take a completely new approach to the things we're doing every day. Yeah, for sure. I mean, and I, I'd love to unpack that you know, getting closer to sales and, and, and the data piece and, and how, you, how you orchestrate that. I mean, was it strategy first? Was it tooling first? What did, what did that look like? You know, the first one was, first was a chip on the shoulder. So I'm looking out of <laughs> our window in downtown Indianapolis right now at the second biggest Salesforce presence in the world. And Salesforce was a customer of ours. And, you know, before I got here, we lost them. And I was just shocked considering, you know, A, they're across the street. B, my CEO, Brian, was the, the chief product officer at Salesforce Marketing Cloud. And like, there's a lot of connected tissue. A lot of employees here came from Salesforce, or the exact target. Yeah. And um, 
there's no reason on earth that we should be this close to know everyone that's in the buying committee and not have them be a customer when they, you know, have clearly demonstrated the need. So we were just like, you know what, let's try like hell to win this account back. Let's do everything we can. Let's pull out all the stuffs. Marketing, the entire marketing team is going to support this one AE on this one account. And so that's what we did. We built, you know, a personalized landing page. We bought a URL, um, sixfreelovesalesforce.com. We got a bunch of personalized Starbucks cards made that had that URL printed on them. And we sent those to the 10 people. We knew there were exactly 10 people in the buying committee. And so we sent those 10 cards out to those people. And we knew that because this was, you know, you know, pr- pretty private URL, anytime we saw activity on that webpage, we knew it had to be someone from Salesforce clicking in on it. Um, we had six or campaigns running at the same time, by the way. And um, as soon as we saw any activity, you know, our AE pounced on it and started making outreach. And, you know, at the end of the day, we spent $58 on this campaign. It was $8 for URL. And you know, ten five dollars Starbucks cards, and so ROI would have been huge if we had won them, but we did. But um, you know, when it was all over and the dust settled, we we looked at each other and we're like, "Wow, that was I guess ABM, right?" And we all agreed it was the same. So we're like, "Hey, how do we scale that? How do we do it better? How do we work with more AEs? What kind of data do we need to to make this better?" And it just kind of scaled up from there. That's amazing. I think um, the big topic amongst marketers and demand gen folks is is almost the the definition of account based and if it's if it's one to one or if it's one to fewer if it's one to many so i i know that you've scaled beyond kind of that initial one to one so maybe tell us how you evolved it into to one to few and then one to many yeah yeah absolutely so after that we're like you know let's let's do this times 100 and so what we did is we really just ripped off that same playbook and we just did through kind of brute force made 100 personalized landing pages hundred personalized six or campaigns. Um, and we still didn't have any tech supporting us, right? Like our accounts were picked from, this is actually a big learning for us. We, we went to our AEs and said, Hey, we're just what we're doing ABM now. Each of you pick 10 accounts and we will just market the crap out of them for you. Um, soften them up, make it easy for you to get in there. And so when the AEs came back, we got logos like Nike and Caribbean cruises and, you know, J crew and companies that would never, ever buy a B2B marketing solution. And so this is where we first felt the pang that, okay, we need better data here. We need to have, you know, something influencing our decisions on who we're going after other than just, you know, cool logos that we'd like to work with. And so um, we uh, brought on a tool to help us with our account selection. We basically did, you know, a firmographic, you know, study kind of based on our closed ones. You know, who do we think are going to be our future best customers? Kind of built basically a lead scoring framework for accounts. Uh-huh. And that was kind of how we, we built that going forward. But again, it was still just, you know, like eight of us, seven of us locked in a a conference room, eating pizza and manually building landing pages in HubSpot. And so it worked. We were starting to win. Like finally, like we we had a little bit of victory and that was enough to kind of keep us going. And from there, we scaled it up a thousand. And at this point, we brought in Terminus to do our advertising. We brought on Sendos. So in in this last um, iteration, this will be funny to you, Dan. We were... Packing boxes, we'd round up the entire sales team, entire marketing team. We'd sit in our, our lobby and we'd be packing envelopes, writing handwritten notes. And I'm doing math in the back of my head saying, okay, there's 14 people in this room. They've been here for two hours. Their average salary is this. And I did some quick math. I'm like, holy crap. Like these two hours cost more than the entire Sendoso platform <laughs> in terms of people hours. So that's when I was like, okay, we got to go out and get Sendoso to help us with this part. And at this point, we kind of kind of integrated all of our plays. Like it was just one of these natural progressions where we did a little bit, we did a little bit more, we took stock, we learned what we could learn, we improved improved a little bit, and then we went a little bit bigger. And to the point where um, at the end of the year, we won uh, an award for best pipeline acceleration campaign at the at the ABMEs. And it wasn't one of these things where we had a grand vision to start with. We just started small and scaled up and scaled up. And I think where people are getting hung up is they are not seeing results quick enough. And that can be very scary. And I'm here to tell you that like, you just kind of keep going with it and getting more and more people excited about it and pulling in the same direction. And at this point, you know, our ABM program generates over half of all the revenue that we're bringing in every quarter. That's a phenomenal metric. And I think the question that comes to mind for me uh, is, you know, when you scale from one to one to, to one to few and one to many, um, what are some of the similarities and what are some of the differences in, in the approach? Like, what are those important things that you learn? Uh, yeah, in order to scale that. I think one thing we lost, we went from one to few to one to many. 
was this brute force effort, right? So we stopped doing handmade landing pages and we started doing kind of drift landing pages that had clear bits. So it would identify the account they're coming from. And we were like, okay, that still counts as personalization. It says the account name on it, right? Yeah. And looking back, like that's that's not personalization. That's just a clever hack, right? And people can see right through that. And I think that's one thing we've lost as we scaled up. And I think from where I'm sitting, the more personalized, the more thought you put into it, the better it works. And so maybe for some more organizations, one of many works a lot better than that. But for us, for our buyer and the way we like to go to market, we really like having that personalization. We like to build those relationships. And that takes a lot more work on the front end um, with no promise that on the other end, it's going to be delivered. But it still feels right. And I think it's a lot healthier for our brand, which I think, while tough to quantify, is a lot more important in the long, in the long run, um, especially for, for younger startups. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more. Um, what are some of the tools beyond uh, what you've mentioned uh, that you're using to execute these programs? Yeah, so um, we have been using DataFox for our account selection. And it's pretty, it's pretty useful because it does let you dial in exactly what you think or inform who your best customers are going to be. Um, we use Uberflip for our, our content experiences, um, which I think really, really puts a high level of shine on all the great content that um, Brad on our team is producing. Sendos, I mentioned, Terminus, I mentioned, which obviously we're using because uh, they're now our, our parent company. You got to eat your own um, food, man. <laughs> exactly. Drift we use. Um, we use for, uh, and we still use Drift for a lot of our kind of account based activity, but we don't necessarily make them our destination for every single ad we're running depending on the value of the account that we perceive and how far along the revenue journey they are, we'll still crack open HubSpot and we will build a completely bespoke landing page for them. Um, in fact, we are right now doing this for 11 accounts that are pretty late stage. Our head of customer success is getting together his team, recording personal video messages for every single account, introducing himself and his team to kind of say, hey, here's how we're going to take care of this account once you become a customer. We're building their first few Sixer campaigns for them. And so we're really putting a high level of thought and energy into it. And then we're going to fund the crap out of ads that lead everyone at that account to this page so they can see how much we care. Yeah. And um, so interestingly, you know, we've scaled from one to one, one to few, one to many. And now, like, I mean, we've kind of been to the top of the ma- mountain. We're coming back down and we're, we're focusing on fewer accounts and we're just trying to make them work really, really well. That's, that's great. I think a follow-up question um, would be, you know, you, you talked to a bit about not being able to necessarily build a, a mousetrap that was going to capture the revenue that you were expected to bring in from your from your investors, right? And your exec team. And you've been able to scale your ABM team program to be able to hit about 50% of that revenue. How do you see traditional demand gen fitting into this ABM world? Like, are you are you running a double funnel or any other kind of methodology like that? We are, yeah. The other half of our revenue is coming from uh, what we consider inbound sources, which we call, you know, I mean, basically organic uh, paid events um, referrals. And so we are running, in fact, the same um, person on my team, Jess, who's absolutely brilliant. She runs all of our demand programs and runs all of our digital ABM. So it's like coming from the exact same place. And a lot of the work she does on one funnel is completely applicable to the other one. So there's not a whole lot of rework. Um, I think there's a lot in common. Where I really think this double funnel comes into place is with our outbound team. So we, I guess maybe two quarters ago, made the decision to rehouse the outbound team under marketing. They were before under sales. And we've noticed a huge shift in that. I know there's a lot of conversation about where, where should your SDRs, your BDRs, whatever you call them, live. Um, I used to be ambivalent. I'm like, you know, wherever. I now firmly think that they are a every, every bit a marketing team. Um, They are the first line of your brand. They're often the first touch point anyone has had with your company. They need to be completely tight and aligned on your messaging, whatever campaigns you're running. And if you've got them really, you know, lockstep with your marketing program, I think they become a force multiplier for every single thing your marketing team's doing. Yeah, I I couldn't agree more. I think there's a lot of debate about where an SDR organization should sit. And I think first and foremost, it should probably be with the, the revenue leader that's the most passionate about it. But then regardless of whether it's sales or marketing that I think you nailed it. They are your first line of brand ambassador. They need to know the messaging. They need to know the play. They need to know the content of those landing pages. They need to know the campaign like the back of their hands because they're really the ones that are um, going to be talking to that prospect first. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Um, and that's just that's a dangerous place, right? If it's not someone that's passionate about it or the character that's treating them just like 
you know, a robot that's got to make this many emails and calls every day, that's going to show up on the other end and it's going to injure the brand and any future possibility you might be able to generate. It's exactly. I think uh, a follow-up question I would have there is, have you seen your inbound efforts convert to outbound and vice versa? I think there's this whole notion of outbound equals inbound and inbound equals outbound. Yeah, that is, I think if you're doing it right, it should be blurry. You should not be able to pinpoint exactly what the point of origin for uh, an opportunity is. And that was really a tough thing for us. And one of the reasons that impelled us to move the SDR team is that we'd get a great opportunity in um, and it would look like they clicked on an ad, they filled out a form and now, you know, they're ready to buy when, and so, you know, naturally marketers are going to be like, yeah, we're that good, right? We're just, we're crushing it. (laughs) But then we'd click deeper into the record and be like, wow, this SDR has been hitting this person consistently for three months. They've sent them all this content. Like the evangelism was done by the SDR and it worked and it culminated in a very kind of, on the face looking inbound lead. And so that was kind of a a big point of realization for us that, you know what, if we're doing our jobs right, it shouldn't be a super clean um, attribution story. It should have everyone's fingerprints all over it. And that's tough to scale. And I'm I'm sure that probably scares some people, but for us, that's like, that's when we know things are working is when a bunch of people have touched a bunch of different campaigns at this person and it culminated in a very clean, you know, indication of demand. Yeah, no, exactly. And I think um, I think the reason that outbound teams get scared when inbound is commingled is they think they're not going to get the credit. But if you can create these comp plans where where the outbound SDR is going to get that inbound lead, even if it wasn't the exact person, but you can make the correlation that they were working it in the same time frame, I think everyone wins. Yep, 100%. Sure. 100%. And so we do a good job of that. And we really, the whole the whole team, I mean, at the end of the day, we're aligned about how many meetings did we make this quarter? Who cares if it was inbound or outbound? Are we, everyone trusts that everyone's doing the best they can and uh, it shows up. Exactly. Well, who knows? Maybe we'll have you back on the show to talk about attribution and, and how to run an SDR organization because I think we could talk about that for an hour. <laughs> Easily. Absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so I think um, last question I, I have for you is, what are you the most excited about going into the new year? It's a new decade. It's a nice number, 2020. Tell me about what's uh, what's getting you super pumped up. Yeah, I think, I mean, first, I'm, I'm really stoked to see what happens when we combine the teams and the technologies of Sixter and, and Terminus. And I'm not trying to be salesy here, but I am personally very excited about what we're about to create. And I think at more of a macro level, I have, Rian, I'm interested to hear your opinion on this, Dan, because I think you're probably even closer to it than I am. But I've been feeling the pendulum swing back from inbound at an accelerating rate. Like this whole inbound methodology, I think, is kind of falling apart. I think marketing automation's value is diminishing really quickly. And I think that a lot of marketing teams, and this sounds very cliche at this point, but, you know, that whole level of being very intentional, being very personalized with who you're going out after, for me, has been the most refreshing and funnest part of marketing in my career. Not trying to trick search engines or trying to, you know, change a button color to increase conversion rates. Like that stuff is boring, awful, not fun marketing. But building things that people will personally love and people are really, really excited by, that's like, I think, why we all got into marketing. And I think that in B2B, that's finally coming, you know, to be the new norm. And I think that's a really fun and exciting time to to be part of this. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. And I I think it's super exciting, but in a way, it's it's also super stressful because I think what a head of marketing needs to do for an organization is is take the revenue team down that right path to where you're going to have the most meaningful connections with your prospects to convert them to the, the long-lasting relationship that you want, right? But part of that's an education because I think the traditional demand funnel technology providers have done a really great job of showing that demand funnel and if you put X amount of leads in and you get your conversion rates right, then it's almost like a set it and forget it. And that's just so far from where we are today with the amount of technology that's out there and, and the way that people are, um, are buying both on the B2B and B2C side. It's just a different ballgame. Totally agree. I totally agree. And that's probably another topic that we could discuss at some point. <laughs> I think we got a lot to talk about, Dan. I'm excited about that. I do. I mean, I'm, I'm sure I'll see you on the road this year at all these amazing conferences that we'll get to be a part of. But I think with that, I'd I'd like to thank you for joining us today. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, And tell our listeners how they can get in touch with you and learn more about Sixter. Yeah, thank you, Dan. This was awesome. Uh, Anytime you want to do it, I'm game. 
Um, if people want to follow up, Sixer.com, S-A-G-S-T-R, or I guess now Terminus.com uh, will get you there as well. Um, and if you want to connect with me, uh, my Twitter handle is Justin Keller, or just email me, Justin at Sixer.com, and I will probably do my best to get back to you, but you know how we can go. Amazing. Well, if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to the series to hear the latest from leaders on the B2B Growth Show. Thanks for tuning in. We totally get it. We publish a ton of content on this podcast, and it can be a lot to keep up with. That's why we've started the B2B Growth Big Three, a no-fluff email that boils down our three biggest takeaways from an entire week of episodes. Sign up today at sweetfishmedia.com slash big three. That's sweetfishmedia.com slash big three.